Anyway, hi, I'm Chris Down. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch. I hope this talk isn't too boring. I hope I can refresh you, energize you. Uh, I work as a production engineer on the Facebook kernel team. Uh, I used to live actually just up the road in Putrajaya in Malaysia, so it's really nice to be back and enjoy the weather. I come from England, so uh, it's depressing there, so that this is a lot better, to be honest, even with the clouds. Um, my, my main job is uh, on memory management in the Linux kernel, uh, and that includes things like memory C groups, swap, that kind of thing. Um, I'm also a maintainer of the Systemd project, which uh, a little project some of you may have heard of there. Uh, and uh, I mostly work on things like resource control. Oh, that's better. Thank you. Now I can move around freely. Excellent. Um, I'm not just somebody who bangs out code, though. Um, I've worked for several years as part of the Web Foundation team. A few of our members are, are here still. Um, so Web Foundation is basically the team that is responsible, ultimately, for Facebook's overall health. So I try to approach my work kind of from this angle, not just producing new functionality with the hope that it will be useful, but trying to think about how you know, we can make Linux more reliable and usable at scale proactively. So that's uh, kind of what I want to talk about today. Uh, I want to help give you some of the tools and information, like how to download more RAM. Uh, you c you'll need to manage memory at scale. Uh, to do that, it's fairly important to go briefly over the fundamentals to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'll do that in a second. But later, I really want to go into the meat of the bleeding edge work that we are doing in the kernel in this area. Memory management is also a really, really misunderstood area. Um, there are many misconceptions, even among senior SREs, uh, about what things we provide in the kernel, the primitives provided, and what they are good and what they are not good for. Um, memory and management in general is kind of a really, really inexact science where everything is a trade-off. So I want to give you a better feeling about what are the trade-offs which are applicable to your situation and what decisions might be applicable to your workloads. Hopefully you'll come out of this talk with some ideas that you might want to try to make your memory management more, official, more efficient or more reliable in your specific case. First, uh, before we go to that, let's cast our minds back even further. Uh, we've got a talk within a talk. This is, a, this is amazing. Uh, let's cast our minds back to 2017. So I went to a number of conferences to talk about this magical new thing called Sigruby2. Sigruby2 is our big bet uh, industry-wide for resource control and management. And what we mean by that is that they are a kernel mechanism uh, that we are building to balance and limit and distribute things like memory, CPU, I.O., things which you share across a machine. We have pretty good problems at Facebook, like uh, our, our user base is increasing, our product range is diversifying, but with that growth comes scaling concerns that we have never really had to deal with before. It, things are getting tighter and tighter as we go along, and especially in the next few years, we're really going to feel this crunch for capacity. And we simply cannot solve these problems by throwing more servers at the problem. Um, we have hundreds of thousands of machines. We cannot afford to waste capacity across those machines because even a little bit of loss results in a huge absolute number. So we need to use resources more efficiently, and C groups are one of the things which allow us to do that. So you might be thinking here, like, hey, my, my favorite product or container engine already has this, this functionality, so why, why is this guy coming to talk about C groups? Well, that might be true, um, but if it was updated in the last 11 years, it almost certainly uses C groups under the hood. C groups are the most modern and reliable form of resource control that we have in the kernel, and they come without a huge number of the issues which have plagued traditional controls like U limits and the like, things which we traditionally used in Unix. Their structure has lent them to use in all kinds of things like container managers, init systems, resource negotiators, and a huge number of other use cases, and they power a significant amount of the basis for container management today. So learning about C groups isn't just some abstract academic exercise. Uh, it's actually practically useful if you're an SRE. This is also really important because many huge site incidents are caused by lacking resource control. Not being able to readily control things like CPU, I.O., and memory can either cause problems or it can actually make problems which already exist significantly worse. And they've caused some of the most pervasive issues that we've had on our infrastructure and the same for other large companies like us. So we need to start an initiative industry-wide because this is not a Facebook problem. Uh, and that's a large reason why C groups exist in their form today. Two years ago, it, it was kind of a totally different story, though. We, we only had one real user of C Group V2, which was us. Uh, even a lot of other large companies like Google really hadn't started using it uh, at scale yet. Um, so it took a lot of work and overcoming obstacles to get to the point where we are now. Um, 
We had, at the beginning, uh, like when I was giving that talk, a whole bunch of cool and new and interesting primitives that we wanted to use and show to the world. Unfortunately, when we came to use them, uh, it was actually a bit like this. Uh, it, uh, you ended up like with almost the thing that you want. It's not wrong, but it, it doesn't quite like compose to some working system. Um, so we need to work out in which cases we should make uh, the operating system a bit more square and which, in which situations we should make our primitives a little bit more round to achieve the goal that we actually want to achieve. And knowing which one of these makes sense in each situation requires a huge amount of time to gain experience in production doing testing and experimentation. So that's one thing we've been doing a lot of. But why is it taken, aside from that, why is it taken like years and years to reach this point? Surely controlling resources cannot be that complicated. I mean, we've had things like U limits in the kernel and all kinds of things like this for ages, right? So why, why are we talking about something new and modern? But the truth is, like, while we have had those things for like tens and tens of years, actually trying to compose a usable system out of them and getting the results you want out of them is another matter entirely. We usually set a U limit, we set like a memory limit on RSS or whatever, and we just say, I have limited the memory. And there's absolutely no validation that it actually achieves the result that you want. And that is the problem which we are experiencing today. And I'll go into why those things don't compose to a usable system in a few slides time. We also need support from the operating system itself to make resource control work. Uh, one reason this is really important uh, is because Typically, if you just limit one thing, it just turns into another thing. Like, for example, if you limit memory too tightly for an application, you just end up turning it into, like, disk I.O. Because we, that happens because we will start to do things like evicting file caches. We will start to swap out or whatever. So you just kind of turn one resource into another one, and usually it's worse than the situation you were trying to prevent in the first place. So as such, we need a system that mitigates these potential issues, and we simply didn't have that back in the day. This is why you'll also hear me talking a number of times about disk I.O. in this talk. Because without being able to limit disk I.O., like memory limiting just doesn't happen. It's not a thing that you can do. So to be practically useful, we always have to have controls on I.O. when we're talking about limiting memory or doing other things with memory. So let's look at one kind of work which has also been a huge focus for us uh, the last couple of years. While we have had Secret 2 working in some academic sense uh, for quite a while, um, the focus has been on issues that it surfaced elsewhere. Um, because Secret 2 limits resources in a new way, which traditionally we didn't have in Unix, uh, it's exposed issues and limitations in the kernel, which we simply didn't have an answer for. And they've always been there. These are not new, but they have never really been exposed as clearly as they have before. The most classic and pervasive cases of this come as priority inversions. Uh, put your hand up if you know what mapsem is. Yeah, that's basically the result I, I expected. mapsem is a kernel semaphore that protects virtual memory. So when you change virtual memory, when you expand it, when you ma make it smaller, when you modify it, you need to grab mapsem. It's, it's essentially a synchronization primitive that protects the virtual memory address space. So as you can imagine, it's really, really hot inside the kernel because you need to do that a lot. You need to change virtual memory a lot. Um, so imagine, for example, you have a low priority process and you've limited the amount of disk IOs which it can do a second. Uh, and now it wants to do a bunch of mmapped IOs. So you've mmapped a file into memory, now you can modify the memory and it gets reflected back in the file. Uh, so as such, any file modifications require changing virtual memory, so every modification is going to require holding mmapsm. Now imagine you've just run PS somewhere else, or it doesn't have to be PS, it could be some other fancy system monitoring application. PS uses the proc API, this slash proc API, which we all know and love, to read the command line arguments to the process. But where do those processes' command line arguments come from? They come from the kernel reading inside that process's address space. And to read that address space, you need to also hold mmapsem. So as such, internally, we are now going to block waiting for this application, which we have intentionally slowed down, and will also slow down the thing which needs to grab the same lock which it is now contending on. This is kind of a classic problem in computer science. But this is not some academic exercise, like I say. This is probably one of the hottest locks in the entire Linux kernel. And this is a serious problem that we've had. This shows how limiting one resource, IO, can cause problems in another resource, memory, if the operating system isn't composed well. Uh, so you need to think about problems like this when you are trying to limit anything in an operating system. In general, mmapsim just underpins so many operations in the kernel, and it's taken a really, really, really long time to try and prune uh, both the good uses and the abuses of mmapsm in the kernel to the point where we don't have these priority inversions. 
Here's another example of a priority inversion. So put your hand up if you use ext4. Yeah, it's basically everybody, right? Like, the vast majority of people out there in the real world use ext4 as their root file system um, because it's generally well-tested and stable, which is completely true. Um, and this was certainly mostly true as well at Facebook in 2017, back when we started in earnest rolling out Seagrave 2 fleet-wide. ext4, like basically every other modern file system, uh, has data integrity protection, and it does it in the form of a journal. Uh, this journal records which operations are pending so to avoid file system corruption uh, or data loss in the case of a crash. So there is a subtle issue with ext4's journal, though. Uh, it can only flush the entire journal at once. So you have all these interleaved entries, and you can only flush them all at once. You can't selectively choose to flush them. And you may need to flush the data which is actually being recorded by these, by these journal entries before you can actually do anything with the journal entry. So imagine two services which are writing. One of them is super high priority. It's your web server. It's something. You want to have it completely unlimited. Uh, you want to let it write and read to the disk as fast as possible. Um, and you have another one which is limited on I.O. And it's also trying to do some writes, but it's doing it really, really slowly. Because these are going to ha now have interleaved entry entries within the journal, um, we're going to end up completely stalling the entire system until we've done the I.O. limited operation. So essentially, the whole system becomes I.O. limited. Um, so because we are depending in the high priority or unprioritized applications on a low priority application completing just to get what we want. It's these kind of problems that make things really, really, really slow on the system um, when you are trying to do limiting. In this case, there is a workaround, which is based essentially flippantly don't use ext4. Uh, in, I mean, there, is, there are workarounds for ext4, but they basically reduce your data, your risk of, they increase your risk of data loss or data corruption. Um, you can use a file system which has selective flushing, like XFS, another very well-tested one. There are always trade-offs here. Um, we have also been working really hard on B3FS. Uh, back in the day, B3FS or ButterFS or BTRFS, whatever you want to call it, used to be a very scary word. If you said that word to a system administrator, they would run, run for the hills at the first sight of it. The reality is it's very, very stable now. In fact, it, we run it on every single web server at Facebook. We don't, simply don't have those kind of problems anymore. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I don't think it's at the stage where you should be running to the hills when somebody mentions it. Many more issues were found and fixed in all kinds of things that resemble these last two, but these, these two aren't exactly the point. Um, the point is you really have to think about how you're going to handle these priority inversions in the kernel when you're going to use limits, and we had to fix a whole bunch of them to make Cgroup 2 work effectively. One thing that's also really critical to understanding how Linux manages memory is that it has different types of memory. Um, from the CPU's perspective, it, it really has a super naive view of what memory means. It has some ideas, um, like you can read or execute or write a page, but it, it doesn't really know exactly what is in the memory or like what it means. Um, for example, anonymous memory is, as the name would imply, not backed by any backing store. So memory which is explicitly allocated during the application lifetime is usually anonymous because you don't really back it by anything usually. Um, most people also know about cache and buffers. Uh, two sides of the same coin, caches typically cache the file content, whereas buffers like tip traditionally cache the block data from disk. Um, for a long time now, they have been uh, completely the same thing inside the kernel, part of the unified page cache, so I will just refer to them all as the page cache probably from now on. Um, but if you ask most Linux admins, uh, they will say that, oh yeah, you know, like that memory is essentially free. Like you can just like get rid of the, them if there's some memory pressure. But here's a problem: they are right in saying that those pages are reclaimable, but they misunderstand what reclaimable means. Reclaimable doesn't mean you're guaranteed to reclaim it. It means you might be able to reclaim it if if you ask nicely. Uh, and that's the problem. For example, if some application is absolutely hammering on some file, we are very unlikely to evict the cache for that file. We will just destroy the entire system or application performance. There's no reason we should do that. In that case, it may be significantly more critical than the pages we are holding for code or anonymous memory. Uh, so in that case, it really, really matters, and we're not going to evict it. This can cause some confusion, and I'm sure anyone who works at Facebook has seen internally like people asking questions like, why does my application oom? When I have so many caches and buffers available, why doesn't Linux just evict the caches and buffers? And the answer is because Linux has decided that it simply could not do that without completely destroying your application performance. And it's usually right. The fact that caches can be essential is also an example of why RSS, or the resident set size, a thing that we love to measure, 
is really kind of bullshit. Um, the reason we measure RSS is not because it's a good measurement. It's because it's really easy to measure. That's a really shitty reason to measure stuff. Uh, it's like the equivalent of like dropping your keys in the park and then walking out to the street and going to the street light and looking for your keys there because it's easier to look for them. It, it doesn't make any sense. Like we, we've 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 kind of distilled wrong metrics to a fine art with this thing because I mean we use it all over in our industry and we have it on graphs everywhere. It, it really doesn't mean shit. And this is the problem. So when somebody asks you how much memory your application uses, the only sensible answer, unless you've really compressed your application and monitored the performance metrics and pushed it to the absolute limit, is that you have no clue. You have absolutely no idea how much memory your application uses. And this goes for a huge number of applications I'm sure you run in production, and it's a scary thought. This is one reason why, in modern resource control, typically we try and limit every single type of memory together. We don't try and call out some particular type of memory. Because otherwise, you could just trivially still allow one application to impact the performance of the rest of the system or break isolation by using a different type of memory than what it used before. This brings us somewhat neatly onto Swap, a controversial topic. Uh, swap is a generally like a super widely misunderstood concept. Um, at the beginning of last year, I wrote this uh, note on my blog called In Defense of Swap that got some attention at the time. Uh, but I wrote this note because we had just had a site incident which I had investigated. And in this site incident, I had found that if only the underlying machines had had Swap, the effects would either have been significantly less pronounced or it wouldn't have happened at all. If you haven't read it and perceive Swap is not useful, I do recommend reading it. Um, but let's go over a little bit of why, why Swap is useful. So a lot of people think that Swap is mostly irrelevant nowadays with tens and tens of gigabytes of memory. And this is all based on some misconception that Swap is somehow directly related to RAM. And that's just simply not, simply not true. Um, and the things that Swap is good at, you simply can't get them any other way. And the things that Swap is bad at, you can totally mitigate those. So you are essentially throwing away reliability. Um, using swap is almost strictly about promoting positive memory pressure, using as much memory as we possibly can on the system without going over the edge. And it has almost nothing at all to do with this concept of emergency memory or slower RAM. or like These are all like complete misconceptions about what swap is supposed to do. People also have this strange idea that swap, if you run without swap, somehow you don't end up with disk I.O. as a result of memory freeing. And this is obviously not true, though. If we, if we evict file cache pages, then we're obviously going to have to hit the disk for those. So you just don't see it in some metric. It's another classic example of because there's an easy metric for it, we pay more attention to it. And that's just absolute nonsense in our industry. And these kind of misunderstandings have really hobbled Swap's reputation and led to these misconceptions that it's not useful in the modern era, which are just simply not true. So if swap isn't a mechanism to expand your RAM or have emergency RAM, what is it? Well, swap is related to the memory types we were talking earlier. It allows reclaim on these types of memory that would otherwise be locked into RAM because we don't have any backing store for them. That is, it provides the backing store for memory, like anonymous memory, which doesn't have any place to go back to. Without swap, it's really hard to run hot on a memory. It's really hard to load a machine up on memory for a memory-bound workload because you can, in an instant, go from making the most efficient use of the machine to, oops, you went one over and now the machine is completely dead. With swap, you at least have some kind of way of mitigating this problem. And yes, it does have some trade-offs and some downsides, which I'll go into, I go into the, in this post and we'll go into it a little bit in this talk. But in general, it is a positive thing to have on your system. You don't want these super sudden memory pressure increases. One reason that people don't like swap, as mentioned, is because of the oom killer. Uh, the kernel oom killer is what's invoked when the system is ostensibly out of memory. It's essentially a massive, massive cannon that you fire at some application and you pray you fired it in the right direction. Uh, and usually you kind of fired it up instead of down or something like that. Uh, the oom the killer in general like, has two fairly major constraints. One is if you use it, you've already lost. Uh, like probably all applications on the system by this point are completely destroyed. Their performance is completely gone, and it's really hard to recover them as well. This is because due to the fact that memory hotness is hidden behind the CPU's memory management unit, we actually have no idea when we're out of physical memory. This might be interesting to some of you to hear that Linux has no idea when you're out of memory. It actually has absolutely no idea. It only knows when it tried really, really hard to get some more memory, and it couldn't do it for a while. Um, and that's just the fact of how CPUs and operating systems work and have worked for several years. Um, 
in general, the problem here as well is we need to consult the CPU. We need to consult the CPU to find out which pages are hot, which pages could we get rid of? Because remember, we want to run as with as much memory in use as possible at all times, right? So we are not asking, is the memory full? Because that's the state we would like to be in most of the time, or at least close to it. What we're asking is, is it full and I can't get rid of anything? And we need to consult the CPU for that. And we can only do that actively. We have to poll for that. So we cannot find out in advance whether we actually are out of memory or not. As you imagine, we also only want to invoke the um killer when we are actually completely out of memory. Uh, for this exact reason, the time it gets invoked can be really, really long after you are completely out of memory and all applications have completely stopped working. We have to go through enough reclaim attempts, we have to try enough things, we keep on changing the types of memory we allow to reclaim and what kinds of memory, and eventually we just say, well, I can't do it, and give up. And that could be minutes after you have actually run out of memory. So our goal here should be, in general, to avoid having to invoke the um killer at all during memory starvation by proactively killing applications to free memory ahead of time. And I'll come back to how we actually attempt to achieve that in a moment. Another problem with the um killer is it's not really configurable. We have these magical things called um scores. I love anything in the kernel which says score because it means you write a number and you have no idea what it means. Uh, basically, you put a number, you put like 1,000 or minus 1,000 or something like this, and you pray that this number is higher or lower than some other one, and that, you, you, in general, nobody knows how this works. Like, this, this is kind of a, not a solution to, to the problem, right? Like, it's, it's attempting to mitigate the fact that the um killer really has no idea what it should kill. Usually, if you set it loose on a machine where you are running, say, a web server, it will just kill the web server because it's the largest thing which is on the machine, but that doesn't mean that that was the thing which caused the problem, right? So uh, generally, like, we need something more fine-grained to actually deal with this problem. So I mentioned that, uh, that this works based on reclaim. How, how does reclaim work? So reclaim is this fancy term for just trying to free pages in the kernel. There are multiple different ways that reclaim can happen. Uh, two common ways are this scary sounding k swap d reclaim uh, and this direct reclaim. k swap d reclaim is done by a background kernel thread uh, which tries to proactively free some memory when we go over some threshold. Say you say like, uh, I, after we get to like 97% used memory, I'm going to try and proactively prune the memory down again and keep us at 97%. This happens passively in the kernel itself. It's not part of the application lifecycle. It happens in a background kernel thread. Uh, KSwapD reclaim avoids going into this next and scary phase, which is direct reclaim, which is what happens if we requ re request memory and then eventually realize there's no memory, sorry. Uh, and the problem there is like this actually results in suspending the application which is requesting memory. Imagine if that's your web server. Now your web server is just like completely stalled. And imagine if it was in a lock when it tried to do that. Now you could completely stall all kinds of things on the system. So this is why we have this other proactive case swap D reclaim, which is trying to just keep it a little bit below the absolute maximum amount of memory on the system. So we always are able to satisfy a little bit of the request. And usually this works. Another thing is that reclaiming some things may be easier or harder than others. For example, some page types may be completely unreclaimable, like kernel structures that are visible to user space. Imagine if you went to slash proc and uh, you went into some directory which is supposed to be there and eventually like, you encounter some memory pressure on your system and the directory disappears. And you go, why did this directory disappear? Uh, you can't just remove things from user space's view if they're supposed to be there, right? We need to present a coherent view to user space. So those things cannot be reclaimed. And also you can't reclaim anonymous memory if there's no swap for the same reason. Some page types may also be reclaimable, but just not right now. The question you need to ask whenever somebody tells you that something is reclaimable is when is it reclaimable? Because it's not a binary option. Um, for example, uh, some cache pages, as mentioned, may be so hot that we simply cannot free them. There's no sense to free them. Uh, and the applications just accessing them would just lag horribly if we were to, to take them away. And the same goes for anonymous pages, which, as mentioned, have no backing if there's no swap free. Some page types also may actually be reclaimable now, and we know they are reclaimable now, but we can't just reclaim them. We have to go do something to reclaim them. For example, if you have dirty pages, you have to flush the, the contents back to the disk before you could reclaim them, and that could take a while. Um, otherwise, we would lose the modifications to the data and either cause data corruption or data loss. So it's not as easy as it seems sometimes to reclaim these trivially reclaimable pages. So when somebody tells you, oh, yeah, but it's reclaimable, 
it's, it's kind of just nonsense. Like, you have to ask a lot more questions to work out what that means. In practice, this variance and unpredictability in reclaim means it's typically really hard to tell ahead of time that we are running out of physical memory. But what if we wanted to know that? Um, how would we go about knowing that we are about to run out of physical memory? If, if I asked you, uh, looking at Google people, if I, if I asked you, uh, your machine is about to run out of memory, what metric do you look at to work out whether it's about to run out of memory? What, what, what would be your answer? You don't have to be from Google to answer. <laughs> memory and use. Memory and use. Okay, memory and use. But here's the problem. Like, the memory might be in use, right? But you don't know whether you could take it away. Maybe you could take it away. And maybe it would actually be totally fine to take it away. Maybe nobody is accessing that memory anymore. You could take it away. Uh, and, you know, maybe we go on just fine after that. So the kernel will eventually try and do that. So we, we're not sure whether we are just making the most use of memory or whether we are, you know, whether we are about to run out. It could be either with that metric. What other metrics? I heard so many things. We're going from the left. Scan rate. Okay, my boy. Uh, okay, scan rate. He's fallen for the trap. Uh, so the thing about scan rate is like, if we're if we're using uh, so for people who don't know what scan rate is, so scan rate is like how how quickly we are turning over pages essentially on the kernel. How how often we are going through the list and saying like, can I reclaim this page? Yes or no? Can I reclaim this page? Yes or no? And it can indicate uh, memory pressure. In fact, it would indicate all cases of memory pressure. The problem is it also indicates things which are not memory pressure, right? It, uh, it can also indicate really, really efficient use of the system. It's entirely possible that you are like, making the absolute maximum use of the system, and this thing is creeping up. And in fact, most applications do have some scan rate anyway, because we're trying to run the system as, as, as memory bound as possible. So. So this is this is another choice is average resident time. Uh, there is there is a problem with that, which is like that's not super easy to track and doesn't really like we don't really have like super good metrics around this in the kernel. Um, so that that is one avenue we could go down. Um, but the choice the way we've tried to handle this um, is uh, to build something based on memory pressure. In fact, our original design was based on time to refold, which is exactly what you're describing. Um, but one thing we found was that not all of this pressure has to come as a refault, right? So what we've tried to do is build this metric which can measure memory pressure. So what is memory pressure? Well, we've never really had a metric like this in the kernel before. We have many, many related metrics, like what was mentioned, like page scans and so on and so forth, and memory free. Um, and, we can look, and we can look at those, but we don't really know whether they indicate this system is about to fall over or not. Um, you can only really say in retrospect, okay, this thing looks like it made the system fall over. So PSI, which is our, our pressure metric detector, um, uses metrics specific to a resource to try and work out, is this resource oversubscribed? For example, in memory, we use the amount of time that threads in a particular C group on the system were stuck doing memory work. So sum here means that some threads on, in that particular C group were stuck doing memory work for in the last 10 seconds, 0.21% of the time, which is actually not a bad metric. That's actually fairly reasonable. Full means that all threads in that C group were stuck on memory work. Um, so this could be things like waiting for a kernel memory lock, being throttled, uh, waiting for reclaim to finish. Uh, even more than that, it can be things like memory-related I.O., which can really dominate like uh, refaulting file content uh, or uh, like swapping pages in. These things can be really, really slow, right? So pressure is essentially saying, if I had more of this resource, I could probably run 0.21% faster. It's the amount of time in which we are actually having to wait uh, for that resource to become free. This can also be really useful to you in developing high reliability and high availability applications. For example, you can use this to know somewhat in advance whether we are about to go over our memory thresholds, whether we are about to push the machine over the edge and do load shedding uh, and backing off new requests. And you can't just do this by measuring free memory or resident memory, because again, you don't really know what's reclaimable until you actually try to do it. These PSI metrics are also what powers our pre-OOM detection at Facebook. We do this as part of a project which we've open source called OOMD. Uh, OOMD is a user space OOM killer with this very fine-grained policy engine. And this allows you to encode uh, policies of what to do in certain situations when you're running out of memory. For example, we run Chef on our machines because we want to, we want to have an up-to-date machine. We want to have configuration management, as I'm sure most of you do. However, 
while Chef is important, if the entire machine is about to fall over, I'm okay if you kill Chef. I'm okay if that doesn't run for like five minutes while we're having a terrible time. The same goes for other background work which isn't like mission critical or isn't stopping something else from running. UMD allows you to encode things like this based on pressure metrics. So for example, we can monitor best effort applications like Chef, we can monitor their memory pressure. And if they start to cause contention for others on the machine, we can kill it before the UM killer does anything or before it even causes any performance degradations elsewhere. And using these metrics, we can prevent the UM killer from being invoked entirely while still preserving system stability and avoiding grinding to a halt system-wide. The same cannot be said when the UM killer is invoked which, because it results in a significantly degraded performance even when it actually runs because it runs so late in the life cycle. It's time for another pop quiz. Uh, another trick. Uh, can you tell whether your disk is using above or below 30% of its capacity? Not, not disk capacity, but like its throughput. Like, can you work out whether you could send 70% more requests and we will use the disk totally? What metrics would you look at? Like, right now, in your, right now in your, in your, on your graphs, you probably have something that says, like, uh, you know, disk utilization. What does it measure? Somebody says something very quietly. Yeah, I mean, it's just sort of how many IOPS per space, how much bandwidth per space, and doing the... Mm -hmm. So IOPS? But it's going to be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's a postcard and squares are random. Yes. So uh, IOPS, bandwidth, and queue size were the things mentioned. So these, these are good. Um, the, the only problem is, like, even with these, it's a little bit hard to tell, right? It's hard to judge what can the disk do. And the reason is because disks are kind of a little bit of a black box when it comes to sending stuff to them. Um, because if you just send more and more requests to a disk, it's entirely possible it can do more. Because it's a queued device, it can do all these optimizations internally. And often when you throw these multiple commands at once, you know, you end up discovering, wow, there's more bandwidth on this disk than I thought. Even the same is for, true for SSDs. And as mentioned by my friend over there, uh, you the mixture really matters, like even on SSDs, reads, writes, sequential, non-sequential, exactly what you're doing, like exactly the mixture of IO you're doing, this matters a lot. Um, so it's really hard to determine a metric for loadedness for storage devices. So this is uh, important because as I mentioned, throttling, memory throttling can just turn memory into disk IO. Um, so we really don't want to just limit memory and, in effect, just drive storage performance through the absolute ground, right? That, that's not something we want to do. That would be a terrible experience for everyone on the system, and it would actually be worse than just not limiting anything at all. So the way we've tried to kind of sidestep this problem is by using latency as a metric for workload health. So what we might do is apply a maximum target latency for IO completions on the main workload, say, HHVM on a web server or MySQL on a database server, something like that. And if we start to exceed that latency threshold, we start to dial back other C groups until they hit their configured maximum IO latency thresholds. And this prevents an application from thrashing so much on memory that it just absolutely destroys disk performance. Another problem that we've had to overcome is that there are some things you just can't slow down. There's some IO that you just simply could not slow down. Um, and this is usually IO like things like file system metadata. Uh, and swap IO. This is because these cases are kind of synchronous, like you, you end up kind of everything depending on each other when you make these requests. So if you slow down one request going to this thing, you end up slowing everything down for the same reason that we were mentioning with the journal in case in ext4. But even before we reached that problem, uh, until recently we didn't even have accounting for those things in the kernel. Uh, so before we can solve that problem, we need to work out how to account properly, and that takes a lot of time. If you've worked with a kernel and looked at kernel code before, it's kind of like uh, exactly how you would expect a kind of 30-year-old project to look. It's kind of everything a little bit everywhere. Uh, so trying to work out exactly how to account for these things is really sometimes a little bit complicated. So now we actually do have these things all properly accounted, but as I mentioned, you can't slow them down, right? So as such, we've had to develop this credit card-like approach um, where we record those who did these IOs that we can't throttle and then force them to pay back later with other IO which we can throttle if they should have paid back then. It's not perfect. We do have some other solutions for these, these guys in the works, um, but it works significantly better than not doing anything. Another thing, if you look at my early talks on Siguru 2, was that I talked a lot about limiting things. That's this memory.high and memory.max stuff. Um, 
our initial proposal for Secret V2 use was really just to limit non-essential work on the machine. But this has, among other things, uh, a few problems. Um, one is, on really spiky workloads where the memory utilization is really variable, um, it's really hard to balance a safe limit with one which is not aggressive enough, right? Uh, we don't want to be so aggressive that we affect the general operation of some system service. Uh, we don't want to affect it from, from running in its normal state. But on the other hand, we don't want to kill it just because it's spiked. We don't know if it's spiked and it's actually okay. Maybe it affected the workload or maybe it didn't. Maybe that memory wasn't being used by anyone. Maybe it would be, it would be absolutely fine. Um, but do we really want to just raise the limit? Do we just want to raise it to that spike? A, it's hard to judge how big those spikes could get sometimes. Uh, and B, if you raise it like that, in the normal case, you have no protection at all again. Because in the normal case, that could be significantly higher. Um, so that's kind of a problem, right? Another problem is that uh, resource usage of some system-wide daemons is really heavily tied to the workload. Imagine that you have a daemon locally available to all of your machines with a cache and your workload makes queries on that cache. And how big that cache may grow is really determined based on the other services on the machine. So this is a problem because most fleet-wide services uh, don't have an owner who really knows what reasonable values for their service should be because you end up with it so tied to the workload. So the answer is go and ask this tier owner, right? Because they just don't know because it's so tied to that application. So it's much more easily configurable to really make guarantees to the tier owner about, hey, you want to run a web server, you know how much memory you need to run a web server, we're going to guarantee that amount to you, instead of trying to punitively act to stop other things from affecting the web server. It's kind of, you know, trying to work out every single thing that could affect the web server and limit it is a little bit of a losing game. It's significantly easier to just protect the web server in some way, and we do that by biasing reclaim away from, from the web server. For this reason, we've largely shifted to using these protection tunables, which is this memory low and memory min stuff. Uh, basically, when you're below your protection threshold, we typically don't reclaim any memory from you at all. And if you start to go over, we still consider how much you're protected and keep on biasing memory reclaim away from you. So you have some guarantee that we won't reclaim you as aggressively as other things on the system. So this is all well and good. I've gone through a whole lot of uh, you know, random stuff. Uh, but how do you actually compose them to make a reasonable system? Um, well, now this is where this FE Tax 2 thing comes in. So FE Tax 2 is our overall project for resource control at Facebook. Secret V2 is certainly something we really need to do that. Um, but as mentioned, we also need these other supporting elements to actually make it compose to a functional system. So our primary goals are threefold. One is to stop background uh, services from running a mock, from making the main workload uh, affected by their IOs or memory usage. For example, if metric aggregation goes crazy and starts to steal memory away or steal IOPS away from the main workload, we want to curb that down. We also want to have reasonable behavior if we start to exceed the capabilities of the hardware. Um, so to scale to our future capacity needs, we're really going to need to have the machines having as much of those resources used as possible which also means that there's a risk that you push them a little bit over the edge, right? Like, you, it's hard to judge, and it's hard to keep it like that. So we need to have graceful behavior and graceful failure when that actually does happen. It's also really important that we keep our efforts usable and lightweight. Um, it's no good if we can now load the machine 10% more if we also take 10% of machine load to actually do that. Um, so and it's also no good if we produce a technically incredible system, but when you go to actually use it, you go, I have absolutely no idea how this thing works. So there is, uh, there is an attempt to maintain some usability. So FE Tax 2 comprises these wide ranges of solutions to compose to a usable system. We do need to be able to tune the base OS and make sure that it's capable of even isolating resources. Um, and we need to be opinionated about these kinds of systems that we can run on. Otherwise, on non-compliant systems, we can actually make this significantly worse than just doing nothing. We also know that uh, knowing how to configure resources can be pretty complicated at first. It's, it's a little bit overwhelming. So that's why we provide and document this default C group hierarchy, um, which distributes resources reasonably. And you can benefit from our years of trying and failing uh, to actually get a result which generally works. Um, we also have the aforementioned early umkiller umd running on these machines. On these machines, it monitors for threats to the workload or misbehaving workloads on kind of a shared machine. Um, and it prevents these obviously misbehaving applications from taking down the system or from affecting each other. 
We also have cgroup stats, uh, which runs in the background and exports cgroup metrics to our graph data storage. Uh, this is important because cgroups and resource control in general is only as useful as you can measure and judge and, and mm. understand what it's doing and why. Uh, it's no good if you have all these limits and then people, then you start having stuff getting uh, killed by UMD or throttled or whatever and you can't work out why that is. So having a metric system, having something to actually measure this is, is something which you really, really need and this will be hopefully open source soon. So let's dive into how this actually looks at the base OS layer. So we use B3FS as a root file system. This is needed because as we mentioned, uh, ext4 has some fairly insurmountable priority inversion issues. Um, we also benefit really strongly, coincidentally, from having basically all of the B3FS core developers at Facebook. Uh, not a coincidence, I swear. Uh, so we've worked really closely together with them uh, to make sure it's as compliant with resource control as possible. Um, for example, we, we needed to make sure that we don't have the same kind of priority inversion of B3FS, and back in the day we, we did. So having, having that line of communication is really important. Um, I also mentioned earlier about the importance of swap. Uh, usually we disable swapping on the main workload, but it, it kind of depends on what it's doing, whether it can tolerate it or not. Um, it, it may or may not be reasonable, depending on what your workload is. Um, but we also added recently B3FS swap file support. For a long time you couldn't have a swap file on B3FS because of uh, reasons. Uh, but now it's trivial to switch and reconfigure swap on the fly without having to reprovision or change the partition table or some nonsense like this. Um, nowadays, there's really no reason to use a swap partition. Uh, swap files offer basically exactly the same performance uh, and significantly more flexibility at runtime. We're also really uh, opinionated about some kernel tunables. A big one is write-back throttling, also known as WBT, if you've seen it in the kernel. Um, if you've used desktop Linux in the past, okay, who was using desktop Linux in about like 2005? 2005, okay. How many of you have experienced this situation? You go and you put, oh, this is pretty old school. You get a USB thumb drive, you plug it in the side, and you copy a bunch of files to it. And while you're copying some files, you try and do something, and your whole system is completely, like, doesn't work while you are copying. This is insane. Like, this is mental. Like, um, this, this is all because of write back. Like, this is the IOs you cannot slow down. This is the things you cannot stop. So your machine is getting locked up because of those things. Um, we actually have these problems on servers as well. Like, for example, when, uh, when an RPM is being installed, and it's a massive RPM on a machine, and it get, all decides that it's going to get flushed down to the disk at once through write back, and the main workload is like, well, shit, I can't use the disk. Uh, that's usually not good. Uh, so you want to be able to prevent some of these things before they even happen. Um, interaction with IO latency is a little bit shonky right now. It's a little bit suspect, um, but we are improving this. Uh, IO latency itself just improves this a lot. So you don't have to use write-back throttling. IO, laten IO dot latency itself, having this credit card model really improves the situation a lot. But having these two interoperate is something we want to fix pretty soon. Uh, cgroups are also the bread and butter of resource control. As such, it makes to go into some of our default choices in terms of configuration there. So to get sensible resource control, it's really important to have these clear definition of roles. Uh, I just made some project managers son. Uh, yeah, clear definition of roles. I've said, I've said all the words to make them happy. Uh, for example, we have system.slice, uh, a best effort slice for work which is not time sensitive. This contains best effort, nice to have services which can be killed or throttled in an emergency like, like Chef, for example, or some kind of metric collection which isn't critical. We also have hostcritical.slice. Uh, it's for daemons and services which are required by the system to run. Uh, these are typically things that either the system needs to run or things we want at least for basic debugging when shit hits the fan, right? We want these to still work even when the system is not in a really healthy state. We also have workload.slice, uh, which is for the key workloads running on the machine. For example, HHVM on a web server or MySQL on a database machine. Having these clear distinctions allows us to really clearly delineate resources and priorities based on service role. This is actually how this used to look. Uh, we, you might notice we're using these memory.high and memory.max things, which I've just been saying we want to move away from. Um, this is fairly brittle as it is here because system.slice memory, we contain a whole bunch of services in there and it could legitimately spike and maybe that's fine. Uh, and we might even slow down or kill things when we really don't need to. Um, it's also really absolute. Like we don't, we don't allow for any ballpark configuration, right? You, don't, you can't say, I think my, my service uses about four gigabytes. It's, 
what you're saying is, my service uses four gigabytes or I die, uh, which is not really how you want to run a system. So it's not really great for these applications with variable resource usage. So that's why we've changed to something more like this, uh, something using, me uh, using memory.low and memory.min for protection. Uh, as mentioned, these are kind of a guarantee that we will reserve some amount of memory for a process. We don't prohibit other applications from using that memory. They're not prohibited at all from using that memory. But if the workload were then to request it, we will more aggressively reclaim it back towards the workload, uh, away from those deprioritized C groups. This allows ballparking significantly more easily. Uh, and with some recently upstream patches, which I'm hoping will go out in kernel 5.3, uh, you even have uh, protection even if memory low or memory min is exceeded. We consider the protection threshold even if you have exceeded it. You'll also notice this addition of IO latency. Again, IO control is really, really important uh, because otherwise we're just gonna end up with a situation where you just thrash the disk instead of using memory, which is essentially the worst memory that money can buy. Uh, so. The idea here is to produce a system where we have latency guarantees, some amount of throttling, uh, protection against the OOM killer, and in general, we want to prevent problems before they start to affect the system at large. I mentioned I also wanted to talk about production success stories. In this case, uh, this is a little bit of a scary <laughs> slide, but I will go over what it means. In this case, we intentionally cause a fast memory leak in system.slice on Facebook web servers. Um, don't worry about all the different lines and colors yet, but the purple line here, I don't know if you can even see these colors, but the, the line which looks bad, the line which goes down in the middle, is without FBTAX2. Um, with a normal OS setup, the purple line, it, it kind of takes us on the order of like, wow, it's like 10 to 15 minutes just to recover from growing 10 megabytes a second. That's not even that fast. Like for some applications, that, that, that's trivial. Like you could easily do that. Um, Again, people think the Oom killer will come to their rescue. It simply will not. It, it will not come to your rescue. And thinking it will come to your rescue is deeply, deeply misguided. Uh, it may do so in some limited scenarios, but it, in a, a million scenarios you have not thought of, it will not do so. Contrast that with the FPTAX2 case where we can quickly isolate and stop the leak. In fact, we start the leak three times because it keeps on getting killed by UMD. We are trying to stop the web server from working. These, these are all requests per second at the top. We are trying to stop the web server from working, and we simply cannot. Uh, it, this is made possible by all of these primitives, which I've been going through in this talk, working together, like the IOM memory control, the pre um detection, and swap. And this is what I was talking about when I say we need the support of the whole system to do this. On Tia's running background jobs at Facebook, some of these primitives mentioned were even like part of uh, permitting them to uh, move to more efficient machine types. Previously, they couldn't move because there was so much uncertainty about how much memory they will use for each request, super variable. But now they can use these pressure metrics, for example, to reliably measure if they can take more load or not, whether they're there at the end, and deny these two big jobs before they even start on the machine. Android is also using the, uh, the metrics exported by the PSI project to prevent memory pressure that affects the user experience. Remember the case swap D versus direct reclaim stuff I mentioned earlier, where one reclaim is in the background and one is kind of in the foreground? Imagine on Android, like you are going to press the button that says pay, and now when you press pay, nothing happens because we've said, please wait for more memory. Uh, this, is, this is a real situation, like th this, this, this happens like fairly frequently, like you might load a new view in the application, you might do something else, and we are now requesting more memory, and it's not going well. So latency is absolutely critical on platforms like this. Um, so we are working really closely with engineers at Google to use these pressure metrics uh, to more proactively prevent these scenarios and produce a more responsive and reliable experience uh, for the billions of Android users worldwide. One thing I hope I've managed to get across in this talk is that these technologies are not just relevant to like Facebook or Google. Um, they're also perfectly relevant in whatever workplace you work at. Um, as such, we've also openly shared uh, more about our techniques and tools in the open so you can try them out for yourself. This is not just some abstract paper you will get if you go to this link. Um, we're trying to go over our thinking processes and our results in a way that should be practically relevant uh, to basically any site reliability engineer. One thing I'm pretty excited about is that the new technologies in this talk provide the tools and knowledge to do things that we have simply never been able to do as SREs before. Um, and this is really, this conference is really the first time we've talked about it in a, in a kind of presentation like this. So I hope that I'll be able to come back in a year and talk to some of you and see how you may have applied some of these things in practice. I'm Chris Down, and this has been Linux Memory Management Under the Hood. Thank you very much.
I have two minutes for questions. Uh, I have a curiosity. Sure. Uh, you talk about uh, swap uh, on a different pa partition is no longer necessary. Have I understood uh, correctly? Yes. You talk about I mean, the performance. Yeah. I, I work on the swap code, and I can yeah. tell you, like, we, we simply yeah. don't do much different in the file system path. So can you elaborate a bit more? I'm interested in this topic. Oh, what do you want me to elaborate on? The main thing is we treat every single swap, uh, we treat every single kind of swapping as this very similar in the kernel. Everything is by an inode, so if you do it on a block device, if you do it on a partition, it's just a block inode. If, it's, if you do it inside a particular file system, it's an inode from that file system. And we just write directly through. Uh, so, I mean, the, the performance characteristics are not really that much of a concern. I don't know whether that answers your question or not. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, the question was, then do you get it basically for free just on false system? Yes. There's really no reason at all to use a, there's really no reason to use a swap partition nowadays. I can repeat the question if the mic doesn't work. So, some of the things we encountered that, like, when we tried to replace memory, uh, we had all the replacement happen first, like, in the rest request, and then uh, it couldn't fight to get the file system cache, which kind of sounds counterintuitive to know the reasons behind it. Not sure I quite under, understood. What, what you're talking about, the which reclaim? Uh, I would have to look, but uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, I would have to look with you. We can do that afterwards. All right. Oh, I think I'm about to be kicked off the stage. <laughs> Sorry, how about um, we take questions out into the foyer? But thanks very much, Chris. That was a very informative talk. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciated it. Thank you.